the second week of focus program on function spaces and their application. Uh, we start with a mini course by Professor Ransford from Laval University, followed by two plenary talks. And the same schedule will be repeated, of course, with different plenary talks tomorrow and the day after. And on Friday, there is a colloquium talk by Professor Wolbert. I apologize because we forgot to include the colloquium talk in the message sent by the Fields Institute. So another message will be sent to highlight the, the talk by Professor Wolberg on Friday. Now we start with mini course by Professor Ransford. Tom, please go ahead. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Okay, is that visible to everyone? Sure. Yes. Right. Uh, so um, thank you, Javad, for the introduction. And uh, well, thank you also to Javad and uh, fellow organizers, Ilya and Damir, for the invitation to, to speak at this uh, distinguished gathering. And in fact, I want to thank them for the, the whole focus program. It's a, a really impressive uh, program that you've put together. It's expanded from I think it was originally three months to six months, and uh, it's really incredible the hard work you've put into this. Um, thank you also to the Fields Institute for making it possible. And well, last but not least, thank you to all of you for coming along to listen to, this, uh, to these lectures. So I'll begin. Uh, incidentally, if you have questions, uh, I'll try and keep an eye on, on the chat as we go along. So either you can type in the chat or feel free to open your mic and, and butt in that during the lecture. Okay, so uh, let's begin at the beginning. What is the Dirichlet space? Well, I'm going to use the letter script D to denote this space. It's the set of all holomorphic functions in the open unit disk whose Dirichlet integral is finite. Uh, so that's the integral uh, with respect to area measure of mod f dash squared. And uh, straight away, um, let's see the relationship between uh, what we're doing this week and what was done last week and what you're going to see next week. So there's a very simple calculation you can do if you um, take your function f holomorphic on the disk, so it has a, a Taylor expansion, and you plug the Taylor series into the expression for the Dirichlet integral and use polar coordinates to evaluate it. And what pops out is a very simple expression, this series here, sigma k mod a k squared. So the, the Dirichlet space, you can think of it as being the set of Taylor series, such that this uh, sum here is finite. And clearly, if this series converges, then the series without the factor k will converge as well, which just says that the, if you're in the Dirichlet space, then you're also in the Hardy space, which is just the set of functions such that sigma mod a k squared is finite. But the Dirichlet space sits inside the Hardy space. So everything you saw last week for Hardy space functions remains true for Dirichlet space functions. And we'll see that to a certain extent, uh, even more is true for these functions. So this is kind of where the interest lies. Um, and well, at the opposite end, uh, instead of uh, looking at um, sigma, well, instead of looking at the derivative here, you could just integrate mod f squared, the area, and that would give you a different norm. In fact, it would be the, the same series as, as we have here with sigma, k mod a k squared, except you put the, the k in the denominator, k plus one, in fact. And this gives you another space, the so-called Bergman space, which is a bit bigger than the Hartman space. And so this is going to be the subject of, of next week's talks. Okay, so the, the Dirichlet space is practically a Hilbert space with this uh, expression for the 
the, the square of the norm, there's a, a slight technicality, which is that constant functions would have Dirichlet integral zero, and would only give you a semi-norm. So as to get to get a real norm, it's usual to add something on. And the, the most common choice, I think, is to take the, the square of the H2 norm of F. And then that gives you this expression for, for, the, uh, for the square of the norm. So in that case, you get a, a genuine Hilbert space. Okay, so that's basic uh, definitions. So here's a very, very, very brief history of the, the Dirichlet space. And um, well, the first thing to say is that it was not invented by Dirichlet. Um, the reason it's called the Dirichlet space is because if the definition features the Dirichlet integral, maybe this integral here, so the Dirichlet integral more generally is uh, what you get by integrating the, the gradient of f squared for any smooth function f. And it was introduced by Dirichlet as part of the Dirichlet principle, which is that among all functions that have given boundary values, the one that minimizes the Dirichlet integral is the one that's harmonic on the disk. And it's a way of solving the Dirichlet problem. Um, but the, the name has stuck. Uh, I would say that the, the uh, beginning of the history, at least the more profound developments, uh, it starts with uh, the thesis of Berling in the early 1930s. And Berling published uh, several papers on the subject and then uh, followed by Carlson in the 50s and 60s. And between them, they really uncovered a, a lot of of the, the deeper properties of D. And in particular, I would say that to Berlin goes the credit of recognizing that this space has a, an intimate connection with potential theory, which is a, gives it a lot of the flavor of this subject, which is very different from that of the Hardy space. Now we're gonna see the names of Berlin and Carlson pop up very frequently. And well, I mean, it's after that, I'm just gonna put three dots because there are a lot of developments after the 1960s and well, you'll, you'll see these as the, the lectures go on. So that, that concludes my very brief history. Um, so why might we want to be interested in this space? Well, as I already mentioned, it has an intimate connection with potential theory and in particular the notions of energy and capacity and give it a very interesting flavor. Um, there's also a, a geometric interpretation that's uh, of interest. And um, in order to explain that, I'm just going to go back once again to the, the definition of the Dirichlet integral. Um, so what you see here is more or less the expression you would get if you were to try and evaluate the area of the image of F, the image of the unit disk under F. Um, this is more or less the, the the, the value. In fact, if f is one to one, it's exactly that value. If f is not one to one, then you need to count areas with multiplicities. So you can think of the Dirichlet integral as being the, the area of the image of f. And this geometric way of seeing things uh, has interesting consequences. So one interesting feature is that it's invariant on the Mervius automorphism. So if you uh, apply a pre compose f with a Mobius automorphism of the disk, it doesn't change the Dirichlet integral. And uh, the Dirichlet space is essentially the unique Hilbert space of holomorphic functions with that property. It's a kind of natural property, but it actually characterizes the Dirichlet space. I'm being a bit sloppy there, and later on, I'm going to be rather more precise and say exactly what I mean by that, but it's a uh, it makes the Dirichlet space stand out amongst uh, all the, the function spaces on the disk. Um, one of the reasons that the, the Hardy space H2 came to prominence was that it played a central role in Berling's solution of the problem of classifying the shift invariant subspaces. So once again, I'm going to go back to the, the definition of the Dirichlet space, excuse me for that. Um, so Berling's idea was, okay, we're interested in 
the space little L2. We have the shift, which takes any L sequence in L2 and shifts it one place to the right. What are the closed invariant subspaces? And Berling's idea was to say, well, let's think of little L2 as the Hardy space. I mean, the, the two are just identify uh, the sequence uh, AK with the Taylor series of the function F. And in that case, shifting one place to the right, the, the Taylor series corresponds to multiplying multiplying the power series by Z. So multiplication by Z is the shift. And viewing it that way, it becomes much more natural to, to guess what the invariant subspaces should be. And well, this led eventually to Berling's solution of the problem. Um, so uh, you might ask, well, what happens if instead of taking the shift operator, one starts looking at slight variations, for example, weighted shifts, or equivalently, the ordinary shift operator, but on a weighted sequence space. And one of the very first weights you might want to consider is this one here. And so you end up asking, what are the shift invariant subspaces of the Dirichlet space? And as we'll see, um, quite a lot is known about this, and there are also important things that are still unknown. And well, another reason that uh, the Dirichlet space is interesting is, as we'll see later on, that is, in a certain sense, it's a borderline case. It's right on the edge of being a, an algebra. It isn't quite a, an algebra, but it's very nearly a Banach algebra. And if it were a Banach algebra, it would simplify many things. But this feature of being on the edge sort of makes it interesting. And as we'll see, there are still uh, a number of important open problems. So these are just a few of the, the reasons that uh, one might be interested in studying D. <clears throat> okay, so um, the what I'm going to do in these talks is to try and um, just show you some highlights. I'm not going to give any proofs, except perhaps the other one line proof. But uh, I want to try and sort of bring out highlights of uh, the theory that I think are interesting. And here are some topics that, in fact, you might want to consider for any function space. I think you've just muted yourself. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, so boundary behavior. Uh, how do how does the function how do functions in the space behave on the boundary of the unit disk? Are they continuous? If not, how, how close are they to being continuous? What are the zeros like? So because we have a holomorphic function on the disk, the zeros must be isolated. So the zeros certainly form a, a sequence going towards the boundary, but is there any constraint on how fast they have to reach the boundary? In the case of the Hardy space, we know the answer exactly. Uh, what happens in the Dirichlet space? Is it the same answer? And the answer to that question is no, it's different. Um, multipliers. So if your space is not an algebra, then certain functions in the space will still act as multipliers. And it's interesting to find out what they are because that leads to all sorts of developments. Again, in the, the case of the Hardy space, the multipliers are just the bounded holomorphic functions. What happens in the case of the Dirichlet space? Uh, is this, is, do you have a reproducing kernel? And if so, what can you say about it? Does it have nice properties? And again, I'll, I'll explain this in more detail when we get there. There are problems of interpolation, problems of uh, conformal invariance, and uh, I've already mentioned shift invariant subspaces. So these are all things that uh, one might ask of general function spaces. And uh, as we'll see in the case of the Dirichlet space, a lot is known about them. In some cases, we have a fairly complete knowledge, and in others, it's still rather incomplete. Okay, so these are sort of the topics that I want to, to cover in uh, today and in the next two days. And um, where to find out more? Well, first of all, uh, I um, have uh, produced a, a tech file in which uh, essentially containing a copy of these uh, slides that you're watching. And in fact, I'll send a copy to everyone right now. 
Um, so I guess if you were, uh, if you look in the chat, you should see a copy of this file. So basically it contains a, a copy of what you see on the screen uh, with one difference. I've added in uh, references. So if you want to chase anything up, the references are there. There's more than 50 of them. And I hope that might be helpful. If you feel moved to find out more, then uh, here are some suggestions for places that you might look. So there are a couple of survey articles uh, the first one is uh, dates back to 2006, Bill Ross. Um, and then a, a little bit more recently, Arkotsi, Rushberg, Sawyer, and Wick. Uh, the, the emphasis on, in these two articles is a little bit different. I would say Ross is perhaps a bit more oriented towards complex analysis and operator theory. And the, the second article may be a bit more oriented towards harmonic analysis. And then there are two books. Um, one uh, that uh, I wrote, co wrote with Omar Al Falak, Alan Kelly, and Javed Mashrigi. Uh, and then another one by the same authors of the second survey article. And again, I would say the, the emphasis in these two books is a little bit different. Once again, the, the first one is more oriented towards complex analysis and operator theory, and the, the second towards harmonic analysis. So, of course, there is there's some overlap. Um, these lectures are going to be based fairly largely on the first book in this list. I guess I'm biased. Uh, and so most of the proofs that I don't give in the lectures uh, can be found in the book, at least all the ones dating from before 2014. Okay. So um, I think with that, we're ready to get started. Any questions before I move on? Okay. Um, so before actually diving into the Dirichlet space itself, I need to discuss rather briefly the notion of capacity because um, this will feature in a lot of the, the statements of the results. Uh, I can't really give you a, a detailed introduction to this. I don't have the time, but at least I can give the de basic definitions so that what I'm saying has some logical sense to it. Um, so, Here's the first definition. So I want to, first of all, define energy. So I suppose you're given a, a measure. Oh, I should say before I start, I'm going to de define capacity and potential theory just for subsets of the unit circle. That's all we need in, for this particular course. Of course, it can be done in much more generality, but uh, I'm going to stick to the subsets of the unit circle. So the first thing I need to talk about is what the energy of a, a measure on the unit circle is. So Suppose mu is a finite positive measure. Think of it as being a, I don't know if this is helpful, but think of it as being a distribution of electric charge around the unit circle. So what is the energy of that charge? Well, in two dimensional potential theory, the, the mutual energy um, between two points is basically log of one over the distance between the points. That's logarithmic potential theory. And so what this double integral is saying is that we're simply adding up uh, mutual energies over all pairs of points of the unit circle weighted according to the electric charge mu. The reason for the two up on top here is just a uh, technical simplification. It, makes, it guarantees that the, the function we're integrating, this kernel here, is always positive because if lambda and, and zeta are in the unit circle and the distance between them is never more than two. And, this simplifies certain arguments, but it's not really important. So it could happen that a measure has infinite energy. For example, that would be the case if, if mu were simply a point mass. 
because then you wouldn't have much choice. Lambda and zeta would have to be equal and you would get uh, an infinite integral. And it also happens for um, certain other measures that are not just a sing single mass. I mean, it happens for any mass, any measure with an atom in it, and even for some measures with no atoms, but that are very close together. And, uh, but anyway, that's, that's a possibility. But much of the time, the energy will be finite. And then there is a, an expression for the energy in terms of the Fourier coefficients of mu. This is not very difficult to prove. Uh, I, I mentioned this because it sort of starts to explain why this might be relevant to the Dirichlet space. So you'll notice that there's a factor of k in the denominator here. This basically comes from the fact that the Taylor coefficients of log uh, have basically one over k with some signs. And this k is just the right thing to cancel off the k in the numerator of sigma mod uh, sigma k mod a k squared that we saw in the, the Dirichlet integral. And this is kind of behind the, some of the proofs. It explains the connection. <clears throat> okay. And now I can define capacity. Um, so I'll just give you the definition and, and try and motivate it uh, a little bit later. So we look at all the probability measures uh, sitting on a subset, compact subset F of the unit circle. And we try and minimize the energy. And well, we look at the infimum and the capacity is one over that. So it's the usual definition in electrostatics of uh, the, the charge divided by the potential energy. The charge is one because our, our measures of probability measure. And well, anyway, I just defined it like that. And uh, there are various elementary properties that one can prove pretty easily from the, the definition. Um, so if uh, your set grows, then the capacity grows as well, it's monotone. It has a sort of uh, upper semi-continuity property. If you have a sequence of compact sets Fn that decrease to a compact set F, then their capacities decrease to the right limit. And capacity is, is sub-additive in this sense. Uh, so these are all things that one can prove relatively easily from the definition. And a few uh, examples of, uh, or at least relations between capacity and other notions. So it's related quite closely to the, the notion of diameter. And you have this uh, relation here. I'm not sure I'm ever going to use that, but anyway, the capacity is, is related to the diameter of the set. The capacity is zero whenever F is either finite or countable. In fact, when you think about what capacity zero means, it means that uh, this infimum here is not finite. It has to be that whatever measure you try distributing on your compact set, the uh, it's so squashed up against, its, against itself that the energy is always infinite. And then the infimum is infinity and one over infinity is zero. So that's what capacity zero means. And capacity being positive means simply that, that you can distribute the, the charge in such a way as to have finite energy. So finite and countable sets have capacity zero. Um, that's fairly easy to see. And there are certain other sets that also have capacity zero that are uncountable. So certain types of very thin cantor sets, for example. There's a relation between uh, capacity and Lebesgue measure on the circle. So mod F here signifies the uh, arc length measure of F. And this inequality implies in particular that if you have capacity zero, then you have arc length measure zero. Um, but the converse is false. Uh, for example, if you take the usual Cantor middle third set and just wrap it around the circle, then that has length zero, but it turns out to have positive capacity. So this is this la these last two uh, remarks, capacity zero implies measure zero, but not conversely, uh, will be quite important in what follows. 
Okay. Um, now, I just defined capacity of, of general, of, of compact, excuse me, but we need a little bit more than that as a technical extension. Uh, so I need to define capacity of general subsets of the unit circle. And well, by analogy with measure, you might think that the natural definition would be um, that the capacity of a general set E should be the supremum of the capacity of all compact subsets of E. And for many purposes, that, that works. But for certain things, you, you need a slight variation on that theme. And you have to define the so-called outer capacity, which is usually denoted by C upper star, which is the infimum of capacity of open sets, uh, overall open sets containing E. Um, and the reason that, so the main reason why outer capacity is needed is that it is countably subadditive, whereas that's not true in general for inner capacity. However, you can avoid the, the problem uh, for many sets because of a wonderful theorem of Schoke that says that if E is any Borel set, then the inner and outer capacities coincide. This is not obvious, it's a, quite a, a deep result. And finally, um, a piece of note, terminology or notation that's going to be used quite a lot. Uh, I need to have to express uh, that a property holds outside a set of capacity zero, outside a set of outer capacity zero, I'll say it holds QE. QE stands for quasi everywhere. So that's much more stringent than saying that a property holds almost everywhere. If it holds outside a set of capacity zero, then uh, the exceptional set is really small. And one last thing I, I need to mention, or at least I want to mention it, which will explain a little bit where this definition of capacity came from. Uh, so once again, let's assume we're in the situation where we're given a compact subset of the unit circle. And just recall, this is how I define capacity. It was one over the infimum. Um, so the, the reason for considering infimum of the energy of mu is that that's what happens in physics. If you start with a charge and you plunk it on a, uh, on a conductor, the charge will redistribute itself to minimize the energy. And so it's a natural thing to consider the problem of minimizing I of mu over all probability measures mu on the set F. And if um, this measure, if you find such a measure, uh, it's called an equilibrium measure. So it represents the way that electric charge would distribute itself if you were to place it on F. And there's a, mathematically, you can prove that this exists whenever the capacity is positive. So whenever the, the problem really makes sense, in other words, there are measures, charge, charge distribution to finite energy, then there will be a, a mu for which the infimum is attained. And so I could have defined in that case the capacity to be one over the energy for that particular mu. And moreover, this measure is unique. It will always, charge will always redistribute itself the same way. So that's a proposition. And the reason that this is of interest is that this measure, has, excuse me, um, this measure has a particular property that makes it uh, very important. And this is a theorem due to Frostman, often called the fundamental theorem of potential theory and with good reason. Um, so let's suppose that we have in front of us the equilibrium measure for a given compact set F. And we associate to this charge distribution, we associate a potential. So this is the, the function that assigns to a point Z the energy, potential energy at Z due to the charge distribution here. And uh, this potential function always has the property that it's bounded above on the unit circle by one over the capacity, and you have equality quasi everywhere on the set F. That's the, the theorem of Frostman. So the this once the measure once the charge has redistributed itself, 
the potential energy will be less outside the conductor and constant on the conductor. And the, the constant value is one over the capacity. I'm afraid I, I can't really say much more about this, uh, except that if I were to give the, the proofs that I'm going to skip throughout the course, uh, this theorem plays a, a rather central role. It's very important, but I'm afraid you're not going to see that. Okay, so that concludes what I had to say uh, about potential theory in general. And now I want to, to start to apply this to, to look at boundary behavior. Uh, so maybe I'll just pause for a moment, see if there are any questions. Um, okay, I see most of the questions were uh, technical things to do with the uh, notes, but there was one question, are there Dirichlet spaces associated with harmonic functions on Rn and greater than the three? So the answer there is uh, yes, there are all sorts of Dirichlet spaces. You can do, instead of holomorphic functions, you can do harmonic functions. So instead of the F dash, you look at the gradient. You can look on, on domain, more general domains in the plane or in higher dimensions. There are also analytic Dirichlet spaces in higher dimensions uh, on CN. Um, you can do weighted Dirichlet spaces. We're gonna see some of these things in the course, but most of the time I'm just gonna concentrate on the, the classical Dirichlet space because as you're gonna see, it's sufficiently rich to keep us busy for at least three hours. Okay. So boundary behavior. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, the Dirichlet space is included in the Hardy space, H2. And so any theorem that you prove for H about boundary behavior of functions in H2 automatically goes over for functions in the Dirichlet space. So straight away, any F in the Dirichlet space, you can say that it has um, radial limits or even better non-tangential limits at almost every point on the unit circle. And well, you might wonder whether you can do rather better than that. Could it be, for example, that every function in the Dirichlet space extends continuously to the boundary? That would be nice. Well, the answer to that is no. And there is a simple example. In fact, even uh, it can happen that functions in the Dirichlet space are unbounded. And here is uh, one of the few things I'm going to prove. Here's an example. So consider this uh, power series, Z to the K over K log K. So what is its Dirichlet integral? Well, we just use the formula that I, I mentioned at the beginning, sigma K mod AK squared. So we get sigma K, and this is the mod AK squared. And you end up with this uh, series, one over K times uh, the square of log K, and that converges. So our function belongs to the Dirichlet space. On the other hand, if you consider what happens when Z is uh, real and positive here, and just take the limit for this, as or put Z equals R and let R go to one, you easily find that the limit of F of R is at least uh, this, this sum here. And well, that series diverges. So uh, for this particular function, we have divergence uh, as you go to at least one boundary point. So, uh, okay, so uh, what can you say about boundary behavior over and above what happens in the Hardy space? So the, the big theorem, um, where we, at least the starting point, is this beautiful result of Berlin, which is that uh, if we're in the Dirichlet space, then your function has non-tangential limits, not just almost everywhere, like Hardy space functions, but quasi everywhere. Um, so you can associate boundary values to F uh, that are defined up to sets of capacity zero, not just measure zero, but capacity zero. And I want to emphasize this point because it's going to play a very important role in, in what follows. So the, this is a really important result. Now, just a historical note here, Berling actually didn't quite prove this. He proved uh, 
is result for, for radial limits, but the, the thing goes through for non-tangential limits as well. And his theorem is sharp. So this is a, an improvement on the example that I just showed you, uh, so the theorem of Carlson. Uh, you can actually construct a function of Dirichlet space that whose radial uh, values diverge, not just for one point in the boundary, but for a whole set of points of capacity zero. And in fact, any starting with any compact set of capacity zero, you can find a function whose radial boundary values diverge at all those points. So Berling's theorem is really the, the sharp result. Okay. And uh, the ideas used in the, the proof of Berling's theorem can be developed further to say something about the, the behavior of the boundary function. So I'm going to denote F star uh, by F star the, the radial boundary limits of F wherever they exist. So for the function of the Dirichlet space, this is true outside a set of capacity zero. And uh, in the same article, Berling proved uh, so-called weak type inequality for F star, um, which you can see here. So you look at the set of points, this is a bit uh, perhaps shorthand notation, but you look at the set of points of the unit circle where mod F star is, is greater than T. And the capacity of that set is controlled by some universal constant uh, times the square of the Dirichlet norm of F divided by T squared. And this is quite a powerful result because you can use it to get an estimate for the Lebesgue measure of the set where mod F star is greater than T. And the estimate here looks rather more impressive. It's a, uh, an exponential estimate, square e to the minus B T squared. Uh, so the F can be unbounded, um, but uh, F star, is it's not far from being bounded in the sense that it's it uh, can't be it can't be large on a on a large set. It's large on a very small set. And actually, one can do a little bit better than Berling's result. There's a more recent uh, theorem that actually is due to several people, but the final step was taken by Hansen in 1979. Uh, which is a strong type inequality. And um, well, the, the weak type is a consequence of the strong type. This is very, very easy to check just by elementary estimates. But in fact, you have this, even this result here. And this is really the, the ultimate result. It's a, um, there are certain things where you really need this estimate. Okay. Now, um, we're talking about boundary values. And one of the things uh, Javad mentioned in his uh, lectures last week in, in the Hardy space was that uh, very often you can think of the Hardy space as a space of functions on the holomorphic functions on the open unit disk, but you can equally think of it as a space of functions on the unit circle. And sometimes it's better to do it that way because uh, it allows you to bring in all the tools of harmonic analysis on the circle. And so you might wonder, what about the Dirichlet space? Can you do the same thing there? And one of the first questions you, you would ask is, well, is there a way of computing the Dirichlet integral of F purely in terms of the boundary values of F? And the answer is yes. And you can see it in front of you here. So this is a formula due to Jesse Douglas. And it appears actually in a very famous paper. This is his, uh, it was a tool he used in his solution of the plateau problem, which actually won him a, one of the two inaugural Fields medals in uh, 1936. The other one uh, went to Alfors, who was a student of Berling. So both those Fields medals are somehow linked to the, the Dirichlet space, which is nice. Um, the proof of this is actually not very difficult at all. Uh, I'm not going to stop to do it here, but it gives you a, uh, a very usable expression for the Dirichlet integral purely in terms of boundary values of the function. 
And it has some, some nice consequences. And uh, here is one. Um, and again, I'm not going to start to prove this, but again, it's not very difficult. Uh, from the Douglas formula, you can prove that if uh, F is in the Dirichlet space, then not only does it have non-tangential uh, limits almost everywhere, but are cyclic limits. So uh, the approach region, instead of being a, a cone, which is not non-tangential is, is um, a disk that's tangential to the unit circle. And you can prove that at almost every point, uh, as you, for almost every zeta, as you approach zeta from within uh, a domain like this, the limit exists. Now you might ask whether orocyclic is really the um, uh, the best you can do, and actually no, uh, you can do better than that even. So this is a theorem of uh, Nagel, Rudin, and Shapiro. So if f uh, again belongs to Dirichlet space, then almost everywhere uh, you have convergence as z tends to zeta, even in uh, this region. So this, uh, I didn't draw a picture, but uh, it's uh, a very, very tangential type of region, exponentially tangential. Um, and uh, this is actually the best you can do. Uh, this is part of the result. Uh, but it is an almost everywhere result, not a quasi everywhere result. Um, and uh, if you're interested in, well, I'll, I'll come back to this uh, perhaps right at the end of the, the chapter. Um, another thing one might be interested in is um, what happens if you factorize F in terms of its inner and outer factorization. So uh, I think Jeb had mentioned this in passing in his lectures. So if you're given any function in a Hardy space, you can factorize it as a, a Blaschke product times a singular inner function times an outer function. So I've written that B as a B Blaschke, S singular O outer. Um, and there's a remarkable formula for the Dirichlet integral in terms of these three factors. You separate them out. Uh, this is due to, to Carlson. So um, <clears throat> look at the first term, it looks very complicated. Um, so this, the first term is, takes care of the outer factor. So if there were no inner factor, if the singular uh, measure of uh, S were just the zero measure, if there were no zeros in the Blaschke product, then all you would have left would be the first term. So this would be the, the Dirichlet integral of a, an outer function. And often this is the way it actually gets used. And at first sight, it looks very similar to Douglas's formula, except it's more complicated and messy because you've got products of things and there are logs that appear. So what's, what have you gained out of this? Well, what you've gained is that in contrast with uh, the Douglas formula, I'm just gonna go back, uh, excuse me, just a second. Um, what you've gained is that the, the new formula is, is expressed purely in terms of mod F star, not F star, but mod F star. So you, you don't need, to, so here you, you really need to know the argument of F star in order to be able to, to handle this. Whereas in the Carlson expression, you don't. It's expressed just in terms of mod F star. And for another function, basically you have full control over mod F star. You can define it how you like, the only constraint is that log mod f star on the, on the unit circle has to be integral and mod f star has to be square integral. And subject to that, you, you can define the outer function how you like. And this gives you a, an exact formula for its Dirichlet integral. It's, I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's a really remarkable result. And then on top of that, you can take care of the, the zeros uh, in f in the Blaschke product. And also if there's a singular in a factor, the singular uh, measure also here. So it's a, an exact formula, fantastic result. Now here are a couple of very simple consequences um, that 
follow immediately. So if F belongs to the Dirichlet space, then so does its outer factor, because if you remove the inner factors, what happens is simply that the, the last integral disappears and you just get left with the first one. So the outer factor has a smaller Dirichlet integral than F itself. And another nice consequence is that if you're looking for inner functions in the Dirichlet space, well, purely inner functions, there are not many of them. Uh, because if um, F were an inner function, that would simply say that its outer factor is one, in which case the, the first integral just disappears. And here you have uh, a one, so you can just get rid of the, the mod F star here. And you're just left looking at, at the integral of these two things. And the, the second integral is always infinite unless sigma is zero. So the, there is no singular inner factor. And the integral of the first term is, if you think about it, just the Poisson integral. So what you end, end up calculating is just a, a sum of ones. So it's the value you get for the Dirichlet integral is just the number of zeros of f. So um, the only inner functions are finite Nash products. That's the only way that the Dirichlet integral could be found. Okay, um, so I'll just finish today by mentioning uh, a couple of further developments. And uh, I'm sure people will have suggestions for other things that I should add into this list. So suggestions are very welcome and I'll, I'll add them into the notes eventually. Um, but here are a couple of things that occurred to me. So there's a very beautiful uh, result due to uh, Alice Chang and Don Marshall that somehow makes even more precise the the fact that f star can't have large can't be large on large parts of the unit circle it's a very precise uh, result and the other thing i would mention is uh, as i said earlier the the, the theorem about um, exponential approach regions is an almost everywhere result whereas the the theorem about non-tangential approach regions is a quasi everywhere result and actually there's a whole sliding scale of results where you, you trade off um, the width of the approach region with the, the size of the exceptional set. And so I mentioned uh, a couple of references here. There's a work with Borichev and, and Tumi. Okay, um, so that concludes this chapter. And I think that's just a good point to, to stop for today. Uh, I'll just react to a couple of uh, things in the chat. So Dima Havinson corrects me. Alphors was actually a student of Lindeler from Northner and Lina. I meant to check that before the uh, lecture today, and I forgot. I thought, anyway. And uh, what is the best approach region known in the case of outer capacity measure zero set for functions in the Dirichlet space? So I suggest. Um, that you have a look at these these papers of Borichev and Toomey, which will gives a very complete answer to that. Okay. Um, so before I, I don't know if anyone wants to, I'll stop there and hand back to the the uh, the chair. But before I do that, let me just once more one more time send the file. Those people who arrive late. And apologies to everyone else. Um, um, There's one more question, Tom, in the chat. Do we have an exact value for the capacity of the Cantor set? Uh, so, um, the answer to that is no. And there's quite a lot of work being done on that. Um, we have uh, pretty good bounds um, to the extent that I think we know the value to something like 16 decimal places. And um, we even tried to, I mean, I've worked on this myself, we even tried to, there are sort of places where you can do a search where you, you give a number with enough decimal places and the program will tell you some analytic expression that is equal to this number. And we tried that, but no luck. So 
the answer to your question, Mayuva, is no. We don't have an exact value. So do you stop Tom here? Yeah, sorry, that's that's the end. It's day. Oh. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker. Uh, we have nine minutes before the next talk, but it's a friendly environment if you have